All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, our meeting format is integrated with uh, members of the public via Zoom. Members of the public who are using Zoom may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and on the agenda. So I just want to welcome all of our board members and members of the public to today's meeting of the Board of Community Services. Uh, my name is Logan Pitts, the chair of the board. Uh, to my right is our vice chair, Paul Castillo. And then moving along, we have uh, board members, Madonna Cruz, Carolina Spence, Carol Quant, and Guido Bocaglioni. Thank you all for being here. Um, and our hosts for today are Julie Schultz and Jackie Hammon. Uh, the host will coordinate comments from the public and assist during the meeting and take notes for any follow-up needs. As a reminder, uh, please silence your cell phones again. And as a, another important reminder, the City of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment, free from disruption, and we will not tolerate any hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully, or if necessary, we will end the meeting. Uh, please be nice to each other. Host, please explain how public comments will be heard at today's meeting. Thank you, Chair Pitts. Those attending in person, please complete a speaker card at, for each item that you wish to speak on that are located at the entrance and place it in the basket. After an agenda item has been presented, the chair will ask the board members for their comments or questions, and then immediately following, the item will be open for public comment. Once the chair has called for public comment, you will be called by name to the podium. Please state your name for the record. Each public comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Any email comments that were received by the deadline will have been included and uploaded in the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received are not read into the record. Thank you. With that, I call this October 25th, 2023 meeting of the Board of Community Services to order at 5.05 p.m. Host, may we have a roll call, please? Chair Pitts. Yes. Oh, sorry. Please respond when I call you. No. Uh, Vice Chair Castillo. Uh, present. Board Chair Bocaglioni. Present. Board Chair Cruz. Here. Board Member Lopez. Board Member Spence. Here. Board Member Quant. Here. All right. Let the record reflects that all are present with the exception of board member Cruz. Thank you. You upgraded some people to chair, but that's okay. I know, sorry. That's all right. They're great people. So, um, excuse me, with the exception of board member Lopez. Lopez. Yes. <laughs> uh, Omar Lopez will not be joining today's meeting. Um, we wish him well. Uh, I'd like to open the floor now for public comments on non agenda matters. This is a time when any person may address the board on matters not listed on this agenda, but are within the subject matter of our board. Um, it looks like we do have one public comment on item three from Mr. DeWitt. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. <clears throat> Saturday, the 28th of October is Make a Difference Day nationwide. Here in Santa Rosa, we've been doing Make a Difference Day activities at what we call Roseland Neighborhood for over a dozen years. It's on Burbank Avenue, across from the new Roseland Creek Elementary School. We arrive at 10 in the morning, we stay till noon time, basically just cleaning up the place and stewarding things. We want to thank park staff who in the past have been there sometimes to help us, especially the maintenance folks. Wanted to make sure and get the word out we're doing it again and hoping that some of the park's maintenance staff might be able to come by. Uh, when we had help from the Creek stewardship folks in the past that give us um, trash bags and pickers and things like that. But since Alistair Blythe has left, we haven't had that kind of support. I'm hoping that we can get an organized effort going again. We used to work with Community Action Partnership also, but once Vince Harper passed, that haven't been interacting with us lately, but we'll try again. In the past, I've been coming here asking about how to name parks. And it was discussed that it was in process, some sort of a new approach to how you name parks. And I've never heard anything back about that. So I want to make sure that you know I'd like to hear about it. And you have my address. You have my phone number in the records. So email, telephone number, and mailing address are all available for me. 
So I'd certainly like to be informed when the new parks naming policy comes out. And last but not least, there's an environmental impact report process going on right now for <clears throat> Roseland Creek Park. I'd like to find out where it is in process and when that will be coming out and be released to the public to be able to participate. Some folks in the public have uh, approached me thinking, you know, they'll probably put it out right before Christmas and make it difficult for the public to participate. So if that's the case that it won't be coming around until that time, I'd like to put into the record that we'd hope you'd wait until the new year so you could get as much public participation in the process as possible. This is really important because in the past, many of the members who live out in Roseland feel that our disadvantaged area has been kind of left to the wayside while other areas of the city, which are more well-to-do and have more capacity for modern technology and things like that, are given more interest, if you will. So keep Roseland in mind. Give us plenty of time to have public participation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. <clears throat> I don't see any other speaker cards. Do we have any other members of the public uh, who would like to speak on the site? All right. Uh, seeing no one else, we're moving on to item four, the approval of our minutes from the September 27th meeting. Uh, are there any edits or corrections to the minutes of September 27th? All right, seeing no hands, we will consider those minutes approved as submitted and I will abstain since I was absent. Um, you could note that, thank you. Uh, agenda item five, reports on upcoming events and accomplished events. Thank Director Santos, please take it away. Thank you, Chair Pitts. I wanted to highlight our upcoming Halloween activities. Uh, Halloween at Howarth Park is full already, but we do have 40 spots available at our neighborhood services um, Halloween bash on October 28th. And in the um, uh, attachment uh, to the to the meeting is the link to get to those registrate, meaning to register in advance to get to that activity, but it, it proves to be a really nice fun event. And then on accomplished events, I also wanted to um, recognize our floating pumpkin patch at Ridgeway Swim Center it was a good success on October 21st. And that was the end of my report. Thank you, Jen. And will you please provide the director updates? Uh, yep. Thank you, Chair Pitts. I'll start by, I wanted to introduce this person next to me, <laughs> Kim Grindell. Uh, it started with Recreation of Parks on Monday as our administrative technician, and I'm super happy to have her here at the board meeting. So she'll be filling in the spot that Amy Hennessy uh, was serving in prior to her moving back to public work. So happy to have Kim. She comes to us from the police department. So looking forward to seeing her at future meetings. Welcome aboard. And um, Kim will be, just to kind of roll with that, Kim will be supporting our future administrative secretary, Sarah Costa, uh, who will start with the department on the 6th of November. So I'm really excited. Uh, she'll start with us as our Parks Administrative Secretary and be the Secretary to the Board. And so we'll be looking forward to seeing her at our December meeting because we do skip the <laughs> November, uh, month of November and go straight to December. So uh, look forward to seeing her and um, as well as Kim participating in the future. And um, I've, in your upcoming minutes, you have some board meetings that are uh, some council meetings that are coming up. But I also wanted to add that on the 14th of November, the Martin Luther King Infill Infrastructure Grant um, for approval process will be happening at Council, and that's uh, going to you know do the actual final approval for uh, Martin Luther King Park to be updated uh, with improvements such as playgrounds and sports fields, and um, we've already gotten ahead of, of that, and we've gone out and worked with um, a consultant already to engage with uh, to start to engage with the community on what they would like to see at their park, but. That's just the official, if you see that on there, that's just the official approval from council for the contract for, uh, with the state for those funds. 
And let's see, we, there was a request for an update on Fremont Park. Uh, Fremont Park is in the process of uh, receiving an improvement, a master plan update, et cetera. And we have received a historic report on the park um, a few months ago, and it's since been updated to final. So staff are gonna review that final document and get together a meeting with the design staff and the historical evaluation staff so we can really understand what our parameters are for the future of that park. What is, what are we able to do and what are we able to communicate with the, uh, with the citizens? And once we know that, we'll go back um, and uh, create a process for moving forward and that'll be available to on the website and we'll provide that information to the board as well. And um, let's see, that is that, yeah, that is the end of my report. Okay. Any questions? Go ahead, Carol. Jen, will the um, Fremont Park report be going back to the Cultural Heritage Board for review? Yes, it will. Yes. So, could you fill in this? It will not be coming to us for review. We'll be reviewing the public interaction. Could you um, be a little bit more specific with those steps? Well, once we, once we have an understanding of how much the uh, existing community engagement, do we need to re-engage with the community? That's what we need to determine. Do we need to re-engage and then that will tell us, do we need to engage first and then go to Cultural Heritage Board? Or do we, can we uh, put something together and go uh, straight to Cultural Heritage Board and then back out to the community? What is our, so we're still determining what the process is going to be. So if you just pieces, you don't know how they fit together. Not yet. We'll record at some point with the uh, uh, public record. Yes, we'll post it on the uh, project website for the Fremont Park on the city's Rec and Park I website. I would love to get an email when that's posted. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Santos? All right, Mr. DeWitt, do you have another comment for agenda item six? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. Regarding Martin Luther King Park, I'm curious if you folks are working with the Santa Rosa Youth Athletic Field Trust that was put together back all oh, 23 years ago, I believe. And uh, in the past, they were raising money to help on different things like this. I'm hoping that they're still involved in stuff of this nature. On the Fremont Park effort, I'm certainly uh, hopeful that you'll engage with the public before going to the Cultural Heritage Board. The more public engagement you have with the community, the better off you'll be for that historic park, a place I played at as a boy, and uh, was distressed to see when they put in the uh, cancer memorial. When they did that, it actually was kind of frightening to some of the kids in the area at the time, because if you don't know what that's for, it's like, why is that there? Anyway, <coughs> so be it. Um, I'm hoping they'll check into those things. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, all right, moving on to agenda item seven, our uh, board member reports. Uh, we'll go down the line, if, see if anyone has any relevant reports within our jurisdiction. Vice Chair Castillo, do you have a report? Um, no updates this month. I uh, attended the mayor's uh, lunch. It was, it was good. Um, very nice to see all the various kids there and everyone. Uh, that was good. Uh, as far as parks, uh, the coffee park, still nice, still doing well, uh, well maintained. Um, that's about it for me this month. Thanks, Paul. Board member Cruz, do you have a report? Uh, yes. This past Saturday, I attended um, a Howard, Howard Park walk with um, community Equity Foundation, so um, very, it was very um, DEI, which I really appreciated. Um, lots of um, persons with disabilities, a lot of people of color, and um, just some good conversations. Um, the park looked really good. Also attended the luncheon. It was very nice to um, be in person with other committee members, so that was great. Um, that is all that I have. <coughs> Great, thank you. Nana? Uh, board Member Spence, your report? I was at the same lunch, <laughs> and we had a great time, and it was wonderful to see staff. And, and uh, I think and Iron and Vine is doing a great job in the restaurant, and the grounds and the golf course there look fabulous. Great. Glad to be there. 
All right. Thank you for your report. Board Member Quant, do you have a report for this month? I um, went to the um, Chenate community meeting at City Council, which was technically not a park meeting, but um, I think Jen would back me up the number of times that parks were bought, brought up um, with no concept of funding was um, interesting. Um, a lot of passionate people up there, a lot of interesting ideas. Having sat on this board for a very long time now, I know that parks don't happen out of thin air or out of um, someone's imagination. I also was able to go to the pickleball tennis meeting here. Uh, kudos for to staff and also to the community. It was wonderful to see the tennis players and the pickleball players so united. Unfortunately, I am concerned that they too do not have a real good handle on what a complex would be, what it would cost and where the money's coming from. So hopefully as that conversation continues, that will become part of the conversation. I, I think the pickleballers would have bake sales and um, fundraisers till the cows come home. So it was lovely to see them all together. I also was able to attend a Southeast Greenway Community Park with this charming woman over here, Thea, and that was great to attend as a community member three weeks ago. Uh, it was a wonderful morning. Uh, I also swung by the uh, History Day here at Finley Center last Saturday. It was jam-packed with both people and with vendors. And last but not least, there were at least two dozen people uh, Saturday uh, spreading naked ladies and digging in the rural cemetery. And I told them all to go home and tell their friends that they had a glorious morning digging in the cemetery. Mm. <laughs> wow. We, we did. <laughs> all right. Good. Thank you, Carol. Um, <laughs> board member Bocalioni, I'm sorry you have to follow that. <laughs> Uh, I have nothing new to report. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I kept an eye on our my park at Southwest Community Park, and uh, it's uh, busier and busier every day. It's just fabulous. It's been really impressed with the amount of usage that that park gets. Great. And it's been kept up in good condition. It looks beautiful. That's good. Time. That's good to hear. Thank you for keeping your eyes on it. Yep. Um, my report for this month uh, also went to the luncheon, so it's good to see folks there. Thanks for coming and uh, representing the board. Um, and yeah, the facility looks great, so I'm glad to see they're keeping it up and the food is pretty good. So good job to those folks. Um, my new parks that I visited for this month was uh, Village Green Park on Sebastopol Road um and rinkin ridge park which i think carol you said you've been to that one recently uh great views up there definitely have been scorched by the fire but um there was some kids using the playground so that was good to see um and then i'll also give a little update on the renaming policy uh, that we had someone comment on i also asked about that and where that's at um we are trying to craft a formal policy to decide how parks are named and then farther down sort of how individual monuments and other designations are determined in the park. We never really had any written guidance. Um, so I don't know that that's imminently going to be published, but they are working on that, the staff. Um, we get people asking to rename things a lot. We And people want to put plaques in parks and um, we feel we need, the staff feels they need a, a better um, toolkit to address that. So um, if you want to add anything to that, Jen, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Pitts. I'll just add that we did provide an update at last month so you were, where you were absent mm -hmm. on the park naming policy, reminding the board that they had uh, chosen to wait uh, on any renamings until we do finish that policy and that we, once we finish the board ordinance, then we'll move into the policy. And we're hoping that can happen at the beginning of next year. Okay, great. Thank you for that update. And Mr. DeWitt, do you have another comment for us on agenda item seven? Yes, thank you kindly. <clears throat> Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. Uh, and thank you for following up on that park naming situation to understand it better. I wanted to dovetail on what uh, Commissioner Quant had 
pointed out about the Sinead meeting and the people there talking about parks. There's a preserve there, Pollen Creek Preserve. It was first bought 22 years ago with Ag and Open Space monies and has been held by Ag and Open Space ever since. That could be the toehold to get more green infrastructure up there at that site. <clears throat> During the meeting held at the city, but not a city meeting, it was discussed that um, <clears throat> there were other possibilities for that site besides what the current owner may propose. And people that I know who live up in those areas, many of them have been there for longer than I've been alive, are very interested in having it be <clears throat> a green infrastructure type site, parks, preserves, things of that nature, recreation type things. And I do believe that's something that should be looked into by the board members. Place to play pickles, think of that. That's a fundraiser. Over at the place to play, they could have their pickleball courts there and they could sell them pickles and the whole thing could go like uh, take off, I know it would. And they could work with that Santa Rosa Youth Athletic Field Trust that's been in existence for over 20 years also. And then last but not least, Mr. Boccalioni mentioned Southwest Community Park. <clears throat> the first weekend of this month, the Fijian community came to that park and held a festival there. I don't know if you know about it, but it was large. There were over 180 cars on that site. And <clears throat> there's only a paved parking lot for about 40, 45 cars. That's something you should keep in mind because people park wherever they want to park. They were out there all over the place. There were hundreds of people there. It was a good time. I went and talked with folks there. Very interesting situation. And then Last but not least on these types of updates, on this Village Green Park. You know, that was put in by a guy who was a really smart man named Alan Strawn, and he built Courtside Village out there in the first place, and that was a park dedication. He provided it, then the city got it. That's how the parks used to be in this town, is that developers put the parks in when they put their housing in, but that has since not been the case, and we're not getting as many parks as we need. So I would hope that you folks would advocate that that policy get reinstituted. Anytime new housing's built, they build the park rather than an new fee because we're not getting enough money to make the parks. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dwayne. All right, we are moving on to our first item, uh, 8.1. That is the Southeast Greenway update. Uh, Director Santos will provide an update on that project in conjunction with the Southeast Greenway Partnership. Thank you, Chair Pitts, and I just wanted to uh, kick us off and, and let you know that the city is the, a major partner of the Greenway Partnership, and we are actively working with um, Thea and a, a whole group of folks that she'll describe in the presentation. But uh, I'm here if you have any questions, but really, I you know want to turn it over to Thea to really talk about the history and, and what's been going on with the Greenway since then. Thank you. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about this. I know that Carol's been on one of our walks. I know that Logan has too, so I would invite all of you to join us at any time, and I can give you a car tour if you don't want to walk the two miles, but if you feel like getting some exercise, we do them on Saturday mornings in the spring and the fall. And I say that because just looking at pictures or just looking at the map doesn't give the full impression of what this land is like and what the potential is. Okay. Who's clicking? Okay, there we go. So you can see from that well-worn path that people have been using this land for a very long time. It's owned by Caltrans, and it has divided the neighborhood in half. And theoretically, you are trespassing if you go on the land, but there are two places. This is near um, uh, Carmel, and there's another path behind the Friedman Center that people have been using forever, and, um, and, and they're going to continue using it. Next slide, please. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. I'll yell down to you. <laughs> All right. She's in another building. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> so the green slice that you see there is the Greenway. It's um, 
we had a group of people come study it and they said very rarely do you find at that point it was 57 acres of land with nothing on it and frequently when people have the rails to trails program or something like that they're pulling up railroad tracks to put some kind of a linear park in a community fortunately for us we were told thank caltrans for preserving this parkland for us because it can hold infrastructure in it as well as being an amazing park. It starts at Farmers Lane and continues up. It will be a new entrance into Spring Lake Park for people who ride their bicycles and walk. It will not be an auto entrance. So if you've ever gone in Spring Lake Park through Nwanga, you know how dangerous it is. There are no sidewalks there. Um, the visibility is terrible. There are ditches on both sides of it. So we're really excited for that. And right now, the only thing that is planned on that land is in 2011, the uh, update to the bicycle, used to call, be called the bike ped uh, update, put a class one bike lane in there. So that is in, written in stone right now. Our goal on the whole greenway is to have two lanes, one for cyclists and one for pedestrians, because you know there's always a little bit of tension whenever you have bikes and pedestrians together in a in a narrow space. So that's sort of like what we're hitting, considering the gold standard of the planning for this process. It's got three main streets across it, Franquette, which is not very busy except when school's in session, Yalupa and Summerfield. There are seven schools which, which are within walking distance of this land, and we feel like it is just right for outdoor education. There are three creeks on the property. Uh, there is a, a teacher at Montgomery High who would just love to get out there with her students and, and do some science and biology work on it. Uh, it's going to be a great place for classes to do field trips, for schools to do uh, service learning projects, and to do cleanup on it too. So we're excited about that part of it. The other thing is the green spaces that you see in that area are primarily playgrounds associated with schools. Frequently they're locked at night and on the weekends. And so while well, people always think of that neighborhood, which they call Bennett Valley, I call it inner Bennett Valley, it's not as rich in parks because you have to get in your car and drive up to Howard, for example. And so the parklands that are there, the green spaces aren't always accessible. So this will truly be a neighborhood park as well as a link into connectivity, both east and west. OK, next slide. Thank you. There's lots to see on the land. Obviously, most of these pictures were taken in the springtime when it was nice and green. It doesn't always look like that. Um, there is a walnut grove on there, and about 50% of those trees are still active, alive, viable. So that presents some sort of an opportunity when we're doing our planning. It is definitely a wildlife corridor. East of Summerfield, coyote, deer, red fox, um, wild turkeys, unfortunately, but they're everywhere. And so there are lots of other things. We also see it as a wildlife cor corridor for things that we forget about, the birds, the bees, the insects, because they're all over that area, which was an oak woodland and an oak grassland down on the flats. And there are some nesting birds that also like that habitat as well. So when we go through planning, we want to make sure that we're having conversations about how can we restore this to its natural state in a way, still having areas for active transport uh, recreation, but also making sure that we're taking into consideration such things as low maintenance, low water, because those are two things that we feel are really important. Um, three creeks I mentioned, you see a view of just one of them now, and there's also a beautiful view shed from the flatlands looking up at the, all the hillsides that surround that area. Okay, next slide, please. We've been lucky to have three different studies. The first one was done by a design graduate school program from Cal. The second one, which I referenced here, was done by the American Institute of Architects in 2011. And the third big robust community one was when the city hired consultants to do the general plan because this property had not been zoned. It was just a blank slate of state property in the middle of a city. So that was a critical component for us because we could not appraise the property until it was zoned. But anyway, 
through all of those three outreach programs we had, as well as early on, we went out as a group to say, is this, we kind of did beta testing on it. We contacted everybody we could think of in the neighborhood and said, would you be willing to invite your neighbors and let's find out what people want to do with this land. So we do a little dog and pony show. We hand out a piece of paper and we'd say, write down on one side what you want on the property, on the other side what you don't want on the property. Those funky little studies that we did turned out to be very similar to all of the three big robust programs that we had to find out. And this sort of gives us an outline. I added the last one on the bottom addressing climate adaptation because I think as we look at parks and building sites in the future, we are going to have to take that into consideration. But those are basically the things that people wanted to see. No pools on there, but anyway, we'll see. <laughs> Next slide, please. We've spent 16 years developing relationships with people and getting community involvement. We have the running club and the cycling club from the city of Santa Rosa, who not only are big supporters of us, but they've also given us financial support through the years, which has been important. We table as much as we can. We do water bark every year. We go to the Earth Day celebration and everything, every place we can do outreach to a community in front of REI, for example, we're trying to do that to get the message out. And some people say, People never heard of the Greenway, and I said, well, that's why we keep doing what we're doing, because we want everybody to know about it. It's taken a lot of strategy meetings on our part to make decisions along the way to say, how do we keep the project alive and how do we keep it successful? And so that's some of the pictures that you see there. And then, as Carol mentioned before, we have done these walks. And they, I think we probably had over 400 people who've attended these walks since we've started them. And um, that's kind of nice because they've been out there with us looking at the property, coming up with ideas themselves. Okay, thank you very much. Could you flip the next slide? Thank you. So this is the official map that came out of PlaceWorks uh, study and zoning of the property. The three orange and yellow spots you see there have now been taken out of the property. When we first started talking with Caltrans, it was 57 acres. It's now down to 47 because those 10 acres that are yellow and orange are, are zoned for development, mixed use and medium high density housing, which are nice because they're sort of on the outside edges of the Greenway. But we hope when Caltrans sells that property to developers that we will be able to put a little bit of pressure on them to integrate whatever their designs are into the Greenway itself. And because we feel like it's going to be a major asset for whatever happens in those areas. Everything else you see on there that's green, that is going to be the new park. And I think it's going to be maybe the fourth largest um, park in San Rosa, if acreage is what we're talking about. Next slide, please. So I don't think any of us who started this in 2008 would realize that it would take this long. And that was because we didn't know what we were doing and we were pretty naive. And fortunately, we were able to get a whole bunch of people who had technical and political expertise and fundraising expertise to come on board through the years and help us. And that has been invaluable to us. So I have a list of all the dates on there of what we have done and accomplished. Some of it has been with the various city councils we've been in front of and some of the Board of Supervisors. A very two very important things happened to, for us. One was that Sonoma Land Trust adopted us and they are our fiscal sponsor. So they've been very helpful in raising money. And then the other thing is that the Open Space District gave us a million dollars in a matching grant. Because we always said to the city, please provide the staff time and please provide the technical support, we will raise the money to buy the land. So right now we have raised all the money to buy the land. We have the appraisal, the city has agreed to it, Caltrans has agreed to it. And so if you look at that bottom line in 2024, it's going to be done. And so finally, after all these years, we're looking forward to that. Okay. Next slide, please. One of the things that we learned early on when the architects came and they said, 
develop a public-private partnership for this project because it's too big for you to do by yourselves. And so we have already asked these people to be supporters of ours, but to be partners was a whole other story. But we did draft an MOU with all of them. You see their logos there. And through the years, we have had meetings, you've attended a lot of them, um, that are monthly, bi-monthly, sometimes weekly when we had critical things, where all of these people sent representatives who gave input and technical support. And we never could have accomplished this without all of those people participating in one way or another. And each one of them has made major contributions along the way and has been really important for us. So. So this is just a, a larger aerial. You can see um, Howarth Park there, Spring Lake Park, all the mountains surrounding it. Um, and in the scheme of acreage, it doesn't look that big. But when we start talking about a park, it is big. And we think it's critical not only for the area that it is in, but just the linkage and connectivity that it provides for the east-west connection to the Joe Redota Trail and beyond and up into Annandale Park and beyond in that direction. So that's it for now. I gave you a brochure, it's a little outdated. We're waiting because we don't know what's exactly gonna happen next year. Let's put a new brochure together. Um, my business card is on there. And as I said, if any of you would like to get more information, boots on the ground, I'd be happy to give it to you. So if you have questions, I'd love to. Thanks, Thea. A brochure and a nice bookmark. <laughs> um, great. So just as a reminder to folks, we're not voting today, um, but you can you feel free to ask any questions uh, of Thea or make comments. So um, who wants to kick it off? Guido, go ahead. Yeah, I, had a, I have one. I have a few friends that live on Hohen uh -huh. who were not, in, who said that, yeah, it would be beautiful, but the traffic on Hohen is getting so bad that they were looking forward at one point for that to be a, a freeway, a freeway right. to get to all the traffic. Mm -hmm. Because he said, if I pull out of my driveway, and I, it, I sometimes I would wait five minutes before I could make a left turn because the traffic that he does on that side, uh, it, it's, just, it's just terrible the traffic. And uh, I said, well, you know, they're going to take that supposed to be a freeway, but now they're going to talking about making a park, and he goes, man, it's going to be even worse. He says, you know, I, I have nothing against that, but what I'm curious about is the people that live, because when I lived in Petaluma on Lombardi Avenue, we had the same situation between our, behind our property. But are the people that live along the back rows there, are they going to be in favor of, of something like that? If they, if we talk to them you know, if, if, before they go, I wish they'd have talked to me because you know, now it's people are over here screaming and hollering, playing, and you know, I mean, it just to make sure everybody's happy with that greenway there in their backyard, <laughs> really. I think there are still about seven people who still want the freeway, and I think there are about um, I don't know how many. Some people still talk about housing on the greenway, and none of those things are going to happen except the orange spaces will be reserved for building and housing. In 2012 and 13, Caltrans did a study. They do studies periodically all over the state. Every 20 years, they study a, a highway. And in 2013 and 14, they studied Highway 12 from the coast all the way out to Rio Vista, which is beyond Highway 5. This little section of it, Caltrans determined through traffic studies that they were not going to continue that freeway. We have a feeling they might have thought that in uh, in um, 19 uh, what we say 1970s, um, because they were buying properties to build the freeway extension from the 1950s through the 70s. In 1973, they stopped buying property, and there's one little pinch point on the Greenway where we think that's where they must have known they weren't going to continue with this, but but they keep property on their books for a very long time. Somebody at Caltrans said, well, we don't get rid of a property for 100 years just in case we need it. But they decided at that time they didn't need it. The city was then asked if they were in favor of extending the freeway. Because originally it was supposed, 12 was supposed to extend 
out to Sonoma, but then all of a sudden Spring Lake was there too. So there was all this conversation about should we go under Spring Lake, should we go around Spring Lake, what would happen to it? And so that was a decision that was made on the state level to not extend the freeway, and that won't happen. One of the problems that we know exists on Hohen is so many people driving their kids to school. And if you look at the traffic at school time in the morning and in the afternoon, it's much heavier than it is at any other time of the day. So one of the things that we are hoping is that things like the back to the Safe Routes to School program, which is already in existence, I think in four or five of those schools in the neighborhood, are going to alleviate some of that traffic. Not all of it, because in Santa Rosa, you know, you can go to school anywhere. And so that's a little bit of a, that's a whole other problem. But we do think that we, our goal is to make that bicycle path used all the time. And we know that it'll cut down some of the traffic. I can't promise that your friend will get out of the driveway easily all the time, but we're working on reducing traffic in the area. Yeah. For sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thea. Carol, did you have a question? I did, yeah. You, I wish there were as many passionate people on all of our parks as you are on this one and knowledgeable as well. I truly appreciate your investment in this. And my questions may be more for Jen than for you, but if you know the answers. Um, the first one is the housing that's being built. Will there be a park impact fee? Will some, excuse me, some funding be generated by the two parcels that are going to be housing? They, uh, they will uh, not necessarily have to pay their park impact fee fees. Um, we're going to look at that and evaluate whether or not they have met their requirement. But um, the answer is maybe right now. And um, there's nothing written that says they won't need to do that, but we'll evaluate uh, when they come through uh, to see if they need to pay their park development impact fees. But they second, won't have to dedicate land, for sure. <laughs> second question has to do with um, the status of a greenway. I don't know if Prince Memorial has a status as a greenway. I'm familiar with neighborhood parks. I'm familiar with community parks. I'm familiar with the process a neighborhood park goes through for adjustments to master plans and um, amenities. I'm familiar for what a community park has to do for the same process. What is Southwest Community? and where does it fit into those two points? So I'll just tie on to what Thea says. When we own this next year, part of our process is to evaluate that very question. What should we do with it? Should it be some sort of trail park? Should it be some sort of combination of different types of parks? Should it be just its own single new type of park in, in the city? What should we be doing with that? And a lot of that will happen as we engage with the community to find out what does the community really want? Because we've done a lot of engagement, well, Thea and the Greenway team have done a ton of engagement to find out, well, what do they, what do they really want? And it's been ongoing, and we have a land use zoning plan, but we need now to have the full master plan of the Southeast Greenway developed, as well as the corresponding environmental documents to support that. So we'll be asking, and as we start getting answers from the community, we'll be deciding, is there a place where a new neighborhood park could go or parts of that? What are those options going to be? So it's going to be exciting to discover that. I mean, certainly this is entirely unique in the city. So um, we're asking the same questions as well. And so we'll be coming up with some answers as we engage more with the community. Next so this, the community could be both a neighborhood park community and an entire city of Santa Rosa community engaged in the conversation. Entire city of Santa Rosa will be engaged in that. But as Thea mentioned, like if you want to go to a neighborhood park in there, you know, your nearest community park is Howard, which is pretty impacted as well. So there might be some opportunity there to provide a mixed use of, of different parks type, different park types um, in that in the same area there. So we're in the discovery process. And, <laughs> and I'm a little bit, I'm not as familiar with the technicalities of all these different kinds of parks. But I will say that in the flatlands, because it is flat, it is open, and it is highly visible, we see most of the action happening there, whether it's the picnics or the active and passive recreation. It lends itself to that because it's surrounded by, a neighbor, by neighborhoods. 
once you get to the east of Summerfield, it's on a rise. It has a lot of rock outcroppings. It has a vernal pool. It has a seasonal stream. It has amazing vistas. And it's also going to be a new entrance into Spring Lake Park. And so we see that as very different than what's on the flatland. So, so maybe that's where we're talking about two different things. I don't know. But one of the things that we want to do with all of it is to restore as much of it to natural as possible to require the least amount of maintenance. Thanks, Thea. Go ahead, Madonna. Hi. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, okay. Oh, oh, so uh, my my question would be so restoring to its original. Um, my question would be: Have you um, had any discussion with the local tribal people here on maybe they would want a arbor there, um, or have they in, been involved at any capacity of what they may like to see? Um, I know when I talk to elders that are Pomo that were born here, you know, they would like to see a traditional arbor at a park. Has that happened? It's, it's interesting because I was just having this conversation with somebody yesterday at Sonoma Land Trust and I said, we've got to sit down with, with tribal people and say, what's here? I come from New York and we used to find arrowheads all over the place and all sorts of clay pots and things. And on this grant land, nothing has been found yet that doesn't mean it's not there it's it was a migrating area and and so there weren't really any settlements on the property as far as we know i would love to have some interpretive center there or whatever people want i don't know but i think having some native indigenous um recognition should be there and and I think, um, again, having schools surround this property, it lends itself to be a healing place and, an, and a learning place, for sure. So if you have any contacts for me, please get in touch with me. I'm going to get in touch with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, just a quick question regarding kind of the pathways and these main streets that intersect in Summerfield and whatnot. Uh, are there going to be Bridges, or kind of what's the idea for the pathway? Are there going to be something from one side of the park to the other, or is it going to be more like a crosswalk type thing? Or do we not know yet? I don't know. Well, um, it's too expensive to do a bridge over, a tunnel under. Got it. That's cost prohibitive. Um, I think this could be Rob Sprinkle's problem, <laughs> but he's going to have to come up with some clever ideas about that. The traffic people will. Um, Franquette is a much narrower street. Frankly, the city's going to have to do a lot of work on Franquette because there are no sidewalks there. It floods there. That's, that's sort of been a neglected area right behind Montgomery High School where the fields are. But the other two streets, we are going to have to. We've had conversations when, when we did the master plan for um, the zoning plan, but um, it's going to require some some real information. And, and there's a group in, uh, I don't know if you know them, Bikeable Santa Rosa, who are looking at innovative things that are happening all over the world for, for crossings. And we were just talking about that the other day because there, there's an update to the active transportation plan. And so we're looking at what can we include in that plan that makes it safe for pedestrians and cyclists to go along. And we just want to bring maybe some new different ideas to Santa Rosa that they haven't looked at before. So, yeah, we don't have the answer to that yet. No worries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I think that 2011 report, Theo, was the first time I started looking at this as the project and probably when we met or first talked about it. And uh, my own history goes back further because I used to go to summer camp at Camp High and preschool and play in the orchard. So um, I don't know if they still let kids do that, but uh, if Caltrans lets them do that, but it's definitely a place I loved and spent a lot of time as a kid. Um, I'm really excited. And um, so just, I just wanted to have a, a few questions. Um, it would look like it was the parcel just west of Yalupa that might be housing. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then there was like a blue chunk near Montgomery High School. What was that? Well, that. So, so when they did the plan, one of the things that was a repeating theme is get the schools involved. And as you look at all of those little colored blobs, 
don't hold them to that spot. So what they did was that there's a blue blob that says, I don't know what it says in the key, but it's schools identification. And all they wanted to do there is to say, can we have some place that could be an educational hub? Not necessarily in that spot, but could that be when we do the, the parks master plan, could there be some sort of an educational uh, we don't know what it is. We're, we're looking for bright ideas, but making sure the schools have input and a presence when the planning happens. Great, thanks for that. Um, well, again, thank you for your time. Um, you really are dedicated to this and we need people like you. Um, I bet you didn't know you'd learn all those acronyms either. So mm -hmm. you're basically a bureaucrat at this point. Um, <laughs> and yeah, um, you probably know more than some of us. And again, thank you for being so welcoming, bringing people on the property, working uh, with our staff um, and, and doing this uh, for the amount of time you've done it. And it's not over yet, like you said. So just wanna say thank you. And thanks for coming in today. Thank you. I just want to say too that we know it's not over yet. And when the school, when the property gets transferred from the state to the city, we don't see that as a handoff. We feel like we are going to continue stewarding. We are going to continue having input. The people around the area call it their greenway. If nefarious things happen, they get on the phone and they call the police or the sheriff or Caltrans or me. And <laughs> so the eyes are already on the greenway and we want to continue that stewardship. Great. Thank you. Great. It's a lot. <laughs> um, we do have one uh, public comment on agenda item 8.1. Thank you, sir. Please step up, Dwayne. Thank you, Kyle. It was uh, Dwayne to from Roseland. It was inspiring to listen to that. I'm hoping that that uh, file would be available to the public. If you could make it available to the public really nice. Um, this is really inspiring because there are other opportunities within the city that don't have as much uh, capacity, I think is the term, as this organization's been able to put together. I was actually a part of the Cal Berkeley studio in 2011 because I was a graduate student at Cal Berkeley finishing up in 2008 and my thesis chair Michael Southworth was the person in charge of that program. And at that time, there was discussion that there should be housing put into that linear area. So there would be eyes on the prize, if you will. And it's something that people may want to continue to keep in mind. Because anytime you have open spaces, you get people in there who begin to make them perhaps unwelcoming places. This has been happening in other parts of the city where larger parks, people who have perhaps less interest in maintaining those parks come in there and hang out there and they make those spots harder to actually enjoy. I know of a number of spots that have been degraded because people go in there and when no one's around, they just set up shop and start doing what they do. Uh, by thieves. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they get back into the bushes in different places along parks and they run bike theft rackets. They do all kinds of stuff and people live back in these different parks and areas. We've got them in our area, which we call the Roseland neighborhood, and we go in there on our own and help to try to get them out with the help of the police and parks staff. And I'm so enthused about all this that's going on. I just want to let you know you're all new to the efforts we've made out there in Roseland, but we've been doing it since 2004 when there was a Roseland Creek concept plan put forward by the city after a $100,000 grant from the city, and that's still in the files. And we've been referring to that area as the Southwest Greenway. And we've been talking about it and going to meetings where Ms. Hensel's at and pointing out that if we work together, we'll be able to get that full connection across the city with the Southeast Greenway to the Southwest Greenway and make all kinds of good stuff happen. So we're going to definitely have people at these meetings learning even more from these uh, 
pioneers, if you will, at getting that good buy-in of different agencies supporting what they're doing. And then uh, we'll be participating in the community meetings also. Thank you kindly for your time. Thanks, Dwayne. I believe that presentation just had a technical issue, and that's why it wasn't in the agenda. Are we still going to upload it? Then? Uh, or do it? Was, it was uploaded. Oh, uh, was uploaded last night. So check the updated First agenda. Thing this morning. First thing this morning. Excuse me. We can go over to the parks department. I don't have home internet. I go to libraries and stuff. We can go to the parks department and get a printout. Uh, you are able to get a copy of the agenda, I believe, if you request it ahead of time. Jen, can you Thanks please? so much. Okay. Right at the Finley Community Center. Right here at the Community Center. All right. I appreciate that. Um, great. So moving on to uh, 8.2, Howarth Park, highlights from the park and maintenance of the park. Uh, we're going to have our recreation supervisor, Leah Hernandez, and the park's crew supervisor, Tim Finnegan, will provide an overview of Howarth Park. Welcome. Um, I'm going to start off. Um, my name is Leah Hernandez. I'm a recreation coordinator overseeing the Howard Park Recreations. Um, and then I'll pass it off to Tim, who will talk about maintenance out at Howard. Um, so, uh, do you mind going back a slide? We have an issue. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. So, um, part of my duties is overseeing the operations um, out at Harvest Park, including the attractions, the events, and programs um, out there at Howard. So, uh, we have a pretty big team of temporary staff who support me in those endeavors. I definitely couldn't do it alone. Um, so, you can next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, then she's, it's, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, we have about 40 uh, staff on, on crew, most of which are students, high school and college students. Um, who help us run the animal barn operations, the attractions, the boat, boating programs, and our special events. Um, and then uh, myself and my supervisor, Rob, Rob Beal, who um, oversee all of them. Next slide. I was going to start with um, an overview of our main operations, um, starting with our attractions on the next slide. So we have, um, from March to October is our main season. Um, we're open weekends, uh, and then in the summer, six days um, a week for about eight weeks. And um, one of the main parts of our operations is our attractions, so the train, the carousel, and the concessions. Um, here to date, we've had about almost 80,000 visitors and uh, pulled those numbers from our ticket sales and about 200 birthday party packages uh, with about 2,500 kids participating in those on the weekends. Um, and then the Pony Express has not returned to Howarth yet um, as we contract out with her and she's still recovering from some fire damage. So that's a big question from the public is when the Pony is coming back and hopefully next year she's made progress um, every year the last couple of years. Our animal barn is open in the summer season. It's um, one of a really great program. Um, just like all our other attractions for $2, you can come in and get a tour of the barn. This past summer, we had um, actually 39 animals, uh, nine different species, and we had about 10,000 visitors between um, members of the regular public, the camps, and uh, field trips. Um, this program, we heavily rely on our work experience program that uh, Ryan Shepard presented about last month. And the Animal Barn is one of our greatest examples of that program with, uh, we had 18 youth volunteers and they dedicated 1400 hours of volunteer service um, to help make it an enjoyable experience for the public. We also have a Barnyard Adventures program that we run in the summer. Um, it's one to two sessions based on the age. And on Fridays, the only day in the summer we're closed, 
Um, we ran a program for kids to come in and help our staff and learn about taking care of the animals, feeding, grooming, and just really getting more up close and personal than a typical visit. And those have been a really big success. The kids um, really enjoy it and gain a lot from it and um, just get a closer view and learn about how to take care of animals, which um, I know hearing from past participants oftentimes uh, triggers a new interest um, for them. So it's been a successful program. Um, our boathouse is another huge operation that we run, um, also seasonal from March to just ending a month earlier than the rest of our attractions in September. Um, this summer, we had uh, 18 teen work experience volunteers that helped us um, with our busy summer schedule. We have uh, Camp Watson that comes three times a week, um, Doyle Adventure Camp, and our Neighborhood Services Youth as well. So over a thousand campers um, canoed this summer, including about 150 underserved youth. Um, in addition to our rentals, we also have boating camps. So those are mainly offered in the summer. Currently, um, we're offering boating camp for youth, which is basically the basics of boating for um, introdu introducing kids to paddle boating. So kayaks, stand up paddle boards, canoes. And then we also have beginning and advanced sailing. Um, we received some grant money from the DBW to do some scholarship classes that are scheduled uh, hopefully in the spring or summer. We, um, this past year we had some challenges with blue green algae in the lake and um, it was a pretty bad summer for that. So just for the safety of the youth, we had to cancel um, that session that was supposed to be uh, during a week that we had bad blue green algae. So that is one, one challenge that we face um, running our voting programs and we hope to um, come up with some solutions on how to deal with that as it becomes more present. Can you let us know which state agency DBW is? Well, um, Division of Voting and Waterways. Thank you. As I mentioned, we have a pretty big crew of temporary employees and we've really had to rebuild uh, post pandemic. Um, this is my second year in the position. So when I took it on, we were a pretty skeleton crew. So this past year, in addition to um, all the normal in-service training that the city does um, as a group, we did a lot of additional training to kind of regain some of those skills that have been lost with some of the veteran staff that had moved on. And um, for example, our lifeguards participated in over 60 hours of training um, between the spring and summer. So um, there's just a lot that goes into running all these areas with young people, but they did a great job. Um, I'm really proud of them. And um, we did a, for example, a mock day for our animal barn for the first year. We ran them through a full day of what the barn operations are like before we opened, um, which proved to be really helpful. So. Um, just building on that each year as I become more familiar with everything myself. Uh, we offer field trips and um, this past year those started to pick up um, in comparison with last year. So we do a lot of um, school field trips in the spring, um, after school programs. We had um, Napa, County, uh, Napa County Office of Education, which is um, cool schools and a lot of the Bellevue, Roseland District youth came and it started with one and then they told their colleagues and we had um, four or five trips from that district. So it's really great to get kids back out to the park. Um, and, you know, we, we have them ride the rides, but we also tell them a little bit of a history of Howard. And um, in addition to that, our summer camps, like I mentioned, Doyle Adventure Camp comes from across town via city bus. And um, this summer, Recreation Sensation, which is Neighborhood Services Summer Camp for underserved youth, um, each of their camps came and visited, um, visited the barn, did boating, which was um, a great addition because they're not always able to come in the summer due to transportation. So um, it was a great, great year for field trips at Howard. And then wrapping up um, with our community events, the past couple years we've offered three main community events, which have been really successful. Um, Kids to Park Day is one of my personal favorites because it's free to the community. 
Um, it's a nationally recognized event through the National Parks Trust that's celebrated on the third Saturday of May. So Rec and Park celebrates it by doing a scavenger hunt throughout Howard Park, uh, partnering with local organizations that um, focus on either the environment or outdoor fun. So um, for example, this year we partnered with REI, um, some of our own like Santa Rosa water and creeks, um, storm drain and creeks and mosquito vector. So they follow clues around the park and um, interact with these activities and then get free train tickets at the end. So that was a really successful event this year, over 400 people attended. Next slide. Movies in the Park um, was another really successful event. Um, attendance picked up this year from last year and um, thanks to Parks Maintenance who also joins us on these events. Um, they're offered for five week uh, Friday nights in the late summer and um, I estimated about 1500 people attended, average 250 to 500 a night. So we have um, activity booths, food vendors, we did some themed train rides before and it was just a really great time. I got a lot of positive feedback from the community. I'm just talking to people, even some emails that thanked us for putting the event on. It's also free. Um, thanks to some local organizations that we, we that sponsor, co-sponsor with us. And lastly, coming up this Saturday, as Jen mentioned, is our Halloween at Howarth event. It's uh, sold out with 550 children and their families signed up. Um, it's a trick-or-treat event through the park and then leads down to the lower lawn where we have some activities, face paint, photo booth, um, and live music from uh, the local School of Rock House band, which we added last year was a really fun addition just to have live music in the park. Um, definitely better than a playlist or kids bop. So um, <laughs> really looking forward to that this weekend and um, just love our events out at Howard. Um, definitely a great community feeling. And um, that this weekend is also our last weekend open with the attractions. So we're wrapping up a lot with a bang. Um, next slide. And then we did receive the um, Best Park Bohemian Award, which <coughs> would be a good time to transition to Parks Maintenance as we definitely um, pick the village to get that type of award. Let me actually let people ask questions of you, Leah, okay. um, before I go on to maintenance. <laughs> Any questions or comments from board members? Well, I should say that's all awesome. Uh, I wish I was a kid in Santa Rosa right now. <laughs> um, and it's really good to just see the huge crowds of people in the park. So that's always what we want to see. Um, people loving it and uh, definitely was my favorite park once upon a time and um, you're keeping it up. So thank you. Great work. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Tim, but uh, take it away now. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Pitts, uh, other board members. Thank you. Um, I'm Tim Finnegan. I'm a parks crew supervisor that oversees the parks crew that maintains uh, Howard's Park. Next slide, please. Um, Howard's Park, uh, we're able to staff uh, Howard's Park seven days a week. Uh, um, so whatever's happening up there, we have staff available to maintain uh, the park. Um, we do have uh, switch schedules a little bit depending on the season. Um, during the, uh, the winter times, we tone back the times uh, to 4.30, but during the summertime, the busy time when, when families are enjoying the park, we're able to have it staffed later to that 7.30 p.m. time to help uh, facilitate a lot of activities that happened after, after uh, 4.30 p.m. Um, the district's staff is, um, is, is, is set up um, in District 3. It follows the same as the city uh, council districts. So the, the team that's up at Howard's Park is also the crew that takes care of other parks in that district, which includes Rinkin Valley, um, uh, five other uh, neighborhood parks, along with some of the other um, park uh, responsible uh, areas of responsibility as well. Um, we have one senior maintenance worker, one uh, skilled maintenance worker, two groundskeepers, and one temporary groundskeeper. 
Uh, roughly, they spend about 50% of their time at Howard's Park. Um, depending on the job that they're doing, um, that, that varies just a little bit. So when they have bigger jobs, of course, there's going to be more um, in Howard's Park, or they might be less at Howard's Park because they're doing work in other parks. Um, we try to uh, facilitate uh, the workload with those areas. So um, because of Howard's Park and the way that it's set up, we try to uh, put a little bit more emphasis in our staffing numbers to help uh, support that area to make sure that we get everything covered. Um, so we do fluctuate a little bit, but again, you know, keeping, uh, keeping the grounds at uh, Howard's Park clean and being able to rotate some staff in there is definitely helpful. Next step, next slide, please. So our staff uh, maintains everything that you possibly have at that park. We have some hand in it, uh, from tennis courts, the pickleball courts, the reservable picnic sites, party areas, softball fields, the carousel PMs, um, which is basically greasing it, um, doing uh, checks on it every two weeks, making sure the parks aren't worn. Um, working with uh, recreation staff if something comes up that we can help out with as well. Of the train tracks, inspections, and repairs, um, we're involved with the annual um, inspection that's done by the state to make sure that the uh, train track um, is, um, is up to state code. Uh, they treat it as an amusement park, so the state will come in with their ind uh, independent inspector and check out these ind individual items to make sure that as far as safety, uh, it's all covered. Uh, they'll point out things that need to be maintained, um, things that are out of alignment on the track and so forth, and it gives us opportunity to get those repaired if they seem, uh, seem uh, fit to do. So, Next slide, please. Uh, we also maintain the land of imagination, the playgrounds, uh, turf and irrigation, uh, five miles of trail, the dam inspection uh, and maintenance, the lady aquatic weeds, and coordinate with other departments uh, as needed. Uh, we can't do everything in our in our department, so we rely on our partners in the streets department, um, creeks, um, other areas that could help us in these areas um, to, to maintain it. Next slide. So one of the big um, events that we had here this past year, past year was the, the park of months that we had at Towers Park. Um, the projects included tree planting, uh, playground cleaning, trail maintenance, painting, and weed pulling. Uh, this year we had 67 or 56, excuse me, uh, volunteers. Uh, we were able to plant six trees. We did seven yards of playground sand. We collected 12 yards of green waste and two yards of trash. Um, this is a, a program that we're very proud of. Um, we get a, a support from our, our crews and um, everyone enjoys it. Um, we are able to bring out uh, snow cones. And, um, and this time, because it was at, at Howard's Park, we had not only the volunteers uh, take part in that, but a lot of the uh, park uh, patrons also took advantage of it as well. Next slide. Um, these are just some items that we've been involved with the last uh, this last year, um, kind of the crew in action and so forth. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the things that we were able to <laughs> complete this past year, um, and these are just some of the highlights and so forth. Um, Organizing into the districts, into um, having staff there seven days a week. So um, we were able to, given uh, uh, being able to get some temporary staff um, hired uh, to help us out, we were able to do a, a set up the the, um, the districts, following city council districts, to help us align with where we need this need at. Um, this past year, we had. Uh, quite a few winter storms that we were dealing with um, uh, kept our crews very busy um, coming off out of the drought and some of the drought stresses that the trees had to um, endure for the last few years. Um, we had quite a few uh, tree calls and um, given the pathways uh, around Howard's Park uh, that kept our crews busy, um, getting there early in the morning. Um, finding you know down trees, down limbs, and clearing those at, so they would be open to the public um, as soon as possible. It just kept us busy. Um, 
it was consistent. Um, it was never really a slow time. Uh, it seemed like there was always something that was coming up. And so um, having those crews there um, to be able to handle that was uh, uh, very helpful. Um, another project we revolved uh, with or helped out with was um, uh, clearing some of the lights of branches um, around some of the, the lighting. And then having uh, our electrical department um, assist in putting in the new LED lights around the tennis courts. Um, this is something that we're doing across the board, but because of the uh, use at Howard's Park, this was a priority for us to get those new lights in there. A lot more efficient, a lot better lights uh, for the, the courts. Um, we were involved in um, helping park planning install a new ADA swing in the upper and lower um, play areas. Um, this was something that was brought to our attention by um, a side party that worked with us purchasing these these uh, swings and uh, we were able to get those installed so make it more accessible to, to our, um, our members or public. Um, the crew worked on repairing the split rail fence in the lower um, in the lower oak grove. Uh, this was a fence that's it's right in the open. A, a lot of traffic goes by the fence was originally put in by uh, scouts, and over the years, um, it just deteriorated to the to where we needed to do some maintenance. And they uh, took that project on, um, and it was able to fix it up and again make it look uh, very uh, uh, very neat and very professional. Another project that we were the last project, kind of the main project, was restriping the parking lot. We worked with um, with uh, streets department, who has the uh, the equipment and the technical uh, knowledge to, to do this type of work um, and do it quite efficiently and, and actually uh, do it quite quickly uh, given the, the size of the project. But uh, we coordinated with, uh, with recreation and, and, and doing, getting the scheduled in a good time and then being able to get in there and redo the lines and kind of again just clean up the area make it look like it's, uh, it's a place that you would want to visit and doing a lot of improvements, improving the, the uh, striping on the curbs uh, for red, for no parking, the fire lanes, as well as ADA um, parking lots and so forth, getting those reestablished and repainted, which they were very faded and um, was kind of embarrassing really because here we have these spaces reserved and you could even tell where you were supposed to park. So it's very good that they were able to assist us on. Um, with that, um, that's into my presentation. Open for any questions. Thanks, Tim. Any questions or comments from board members? Go ahead, Carol. Tim, um, I was struck by the maintenance staff and counting up the number of people, which is five, which would be a, about a quarter of the entire park maintenance staff. It's not five people there all the time, as you explained. A mixture of proactive and reactive work could you give us a scenario of a typical day, who's there from park maintenance and what they're doing if there's not a crisis? Exactly. So that there's, we're always gonna have, um, I mean, one person there at 6.30 in the morning. Um, that's where we start out with and so forth. Um, and it does vary across the board we, because of the limitations of hours that we have in the day, um, those are split apart uh, throughout the entire week. So we would have like, uh, we have full-time working on Saturday, we have a full-time working on Sunday, along with some temporary staff. And then uh, we fill them in with the senior maintenance worker during the weekday. Um, during the weekday, we usually do more of the repair type work uh, when we're big enough uh, repairing irrigation lines. That's more technical stuff and um, Dealing with the crowds and dealing with the people up there in the weekend, that would not be conducive to doing that type of work at all. So it does fluctuate across the, the, the week. Um, but typically, uh, our priority is getting the restrooms opened up as soon as possible. Um, that's their first and number one priority. We get a lot of people there that's early in the morning. And uh, unfortunately, we deal with the vandals, the vandals that come during the nighttime and so at one time we did open those up, have those restrooms opened up by our security that goes through early, early in the morning. But given that we have to deal with that element in our parks, we 
we like to make sure that the restrooms are clean and open, clean and open to the public and not have an open, dirty bathroom. And then that way we can check it out uh, and make sure everything is safe. Um, so that's the first priority. And then it's just depending on the crowds and what's going on, um, we try to do maybe that noisy stuff, you know, when the park is not busy, trying to a little bit under the radar yet, um, um, making sure that everything is safe and, and so forth. So again, that kind of is the typical of the, of the mornings and so forth. And as that stuff comes up, uh, they try to schedule projects as much as they possibly can to get work done. But, um, you know, things come up, um, other priorities, trees down. Um, and because it's the, the same crew that does the maintenance work that deals with these trees down, so if we get a tree down on Montgomery Drive blocking both lanes of the traffic, um, that's the crew I'm going to call first. They're the they're closest. Uh, they could be the quickest to respond, and then therefore, um, you know, it takes them out of their regular scheduled work. Thank you for flushing that out, Tim. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, Tim, thanks for going over all that. Um, I'm guessing that being able to mow a lawn and fix a train track to a state standard is a pretty wide range of skills. <laughs> so good job, yeah. you and your crew. Uh, that sounds tough, but you do a good job. I was just hiking around Lake Ralphine last week and it looked great, everything. Um, I do have one maybe weird question. What's with the house in Howard Park? What's up with that? And, and I live there. No, yeah, really. Yeah. What is going on with that? Um, I, I mean, I can tell you what I know. Sure. Um, not much. Okay. <laughs> I, originally, I think it was on the, the plan to take down that we had um, a bunch of buildings that were scheduled at the time to demolish and remove. That was one of them. And then, um, um, it was there was interest from the community on the historic value of that house and whether it could be moved you know can we possibly sell it can we get someone to live there um, and then but what it came down to is our facility maintenance staff felt like the maintenance of that was just going to be too too great um, to do that and the historic things didn't pan out um, and there it sits Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, um, yeah. No, no, no plans right now to do not, not anything. Knowledge. Okay. I'll, I'll just add, I'll just chime in that the real estate services is uh, generally managing that and it, it is available to community members, nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, so, council made a decision to keep that for that purpose. And so, like as a meeting space or um, potentially as an office space. And so, there's been some interest, although. Uh, nobody has completely um, uh, taken uh, a lease or anything like that yet, but our real estate team is managing the space to see if it's if it's possible. And we'll, you know, together we'll keep an eye on it. And if it needs to, if we need to make another, come back to council or come back to this board to say, here's what's been happening. We can we can do that. But right now, it's out available, but um, not being leased yet. Okay. Excuse me. Does that mean it's been upgraded to a usable facility? It has not been upgraded. It is as is. Okay. All right. Thank you for that background. Uh, always wondered. So um, great. Any other questions or comments? No. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Leah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Um, it appears our only public commenter for that item has left, Dwayne DeWitt, so we will move on um, to agenda item nine, committee reports. Uh, 9.1, the mayor's lunch did not uh, happen last month or I didn't attend, I'm not sure. I think they sent the invitation to the wrong email address, but it is tomorrow, so I'll go tomorrow. Um, 9.2, the waterways advisory committee. Carol, do you have an update? I do not think we had a meeting since our last meeting, and our meeting tomorrow has been canceled. Okay, thank you. 9.3, our governing document subcommittee. Uh, we basically wrapped that up um, last month, and we now are in the process of having uh, the city attorney's office look it over and the city manager 
Um, and we will, uh, after that, I believe, bring it back here to vote on. And after we vote on it, it'll go to the city council. So just a reminder that'll change our name uh, to the Recreation and Parks Board or whatever the city council decides to do. It's their decision. Um, it will also change our quorum requirements, very importantly, to four members, um, which is standard for a seven person board. And then some of the other interesting things, it'll possibly add a youth member. We'll be the first board to have a youth member. So we're looking into that and how that would work. Um, and then also we are gonna be the first board to take the city's equity report from last year and incorporate that into our bylaws. Um, so we are just uh, at the cutting edge of city <laughs> government right now. <laughs> Tell all your friends um, and seriously brag your council member that we are doing stuff no one else is doing. Um, that's what they wanna hear. Um, and Carol, do you have any update from that? The subcommittee, anything else? Yep. Okay, great. It's all done. So um, we'll, we'll get it back here after I said after all the lawyers look at it. Um, <laughs> now we are on agenda item 10. Uh, Director Santos, do we have any written or electronic communications? We do not have any written or uh, electronic communications. All right. Thank you, Jen. Uh, agenda item 11, future agenda items. Any item that the board would like to see on a future agenda? Okay, um, and not seeing any of that, uh, we will have no meeting in November. Uh, our next meeting will be on the second Wednesday in December. So that's Wednesday, December 13th at 5 p.m. right here in this room. Uh, with that, I adjourn, adjourn this meeting of the Board of Community Services at 6.29 p.m. Thank you. You made it.